Welcome to Joy in Our Town. I'm your host, Nick Kroger, and as you can see, we have guests of a variety of types, two-legged and four-legged, and uh, we're going to have a very interesting show, so let me introduce you to our guests. We have uh, Sergeant Michael Green, and we have Corporal Son Hill, and over here, our very special guest is Rocco. And welcome to the show today. They're with the uh, Brevard County Sheriff's Office. Well, obviously, we're here to talk about um, canine police dogs. Right. And um, you've got a wonderful example of, of one here. Rocco, how old is Rocco? Rocco's going to turn seven this year. Turn seven. And, you know, you're looking at him. What comes to mind, I think, to the average viewer or, and to me as well is when you hear police dog, you automatically think German Shepherd. I mean, but there are other breeds that, that uh, law, enforcement, law enforcement uses. What are some of those other breeds? Uh, Belgian Malois, which Rocco is a Belgian Malois. Okay. And a Dutch Shepherd. We, uh, we also have Dutch Shepherds in our unit. But German Shepherds are, is the main one everybody thinks of. But there's also uh, Belgian Malois and Dutch Shepherds. Okay. And um, are they just geared, shepherds in general? I mean, I know every breed of dog has its thing that it's, you know, hunting or, or, or uh, what do you, herding. Herding. Um, so what makes the shepherd, what, regardless of what type, uh, instinctually, pr um, you know, lend itself to this type of work? It's, it's a herding dog. It uh, is. A okay. lot of the uh, work dogs are herding dogs, yeah. especially for police and military work. Uh, their natural ability for their nose, that's the main reason we use them okay. for their nose. And of course they're fast, they can see good, but the main thing we use them for is their nose and their trainability. Okay. They, they bred into them the trainability, the workability, they want to work, they want to please you. Okay. And we take that and we sculpt it and we make them uh, working dogs. Absolutely. And in on your force in particular, how many canine you know dogs do you have we have 13 13, 13. patrol dogs okay they're a dual purpose dogs they're called they're patrol slash their specialty could be drugs like Rocco okay and mine Bosco is a uh, EOD dog a bomb sniffing dog. okay talking about training you know I, I imagine people think they understand what goes into training but I believe it probably is so much more um, Talk to me a little bit about basic training or, or, or show me, you know, some examples of that if you can. Oh, basic training or basic training, we go through FDLE's requirements for, for state certification for canine. That's a 480 hour school mm. just to do the basics. That's basic. Every week we have, uh, every Wednesday we have scheduled group training. So the training never ends. You, you start doing 480 hour school then you go and do your specialty school, which could be drugs, bombs, right. whatever. And then you go to the road, and every week while you're working, Wednesdays is our training day. They go and they keep up on their skills because if you don't, right. it's like everything else, you lose it. So, right. so training never ends. Never it's ends. It's a constant thing, and if you don't train, then your dogs don't perform. Yeah. Is there a typical age when a dog that has been identified as a good candidate would begin training? It was around two uh -huh. back 10, 20 years ago, you would get two-year-old dogs. They're, they're kind of matured up by then, you know. You can see they're, they're, what they're set at. Nowadays, since they're so popular and all the militaries in the world are using them in police agencies, uh, you can't be too picky. You have to get dogs sometimes 13, 14 months old. They're mm -hmm. still pups, but they show, they show the drive. Right. They show the signs that they're going to be a good dog, so you, you, you pick them at that yeah. point, and then you slowly start doing their training. And, and that's I, how it's been doing it for the last, I'd say, 10 years okay. to get the younger dogs. Well, can you give us some examples with Rocco on some of the obedience or the, the training that, that, that he has gone through, you, that you've gone through as well? Right, because obedience is the foundation of um, the training. Right. And that's what we start off with, and I'll demonstrate a little bit. With Absolutely, Rocco. please. Come on, Rocco. Please. So, please. So, when I say foos, he'll post to sit down with my left side. Please. Please. Yeah, good boy. Good boy. Please. Sit. We also do hand commands. Right. So if I want to call him, I just tap my chest, and he come to my left side, and he's supposed to sit down on his own without me saying anything. Wow. So what he's looking for now is his reward, reward. for what he just did. 
and we, we give it to him if he does good. Good boy. That's a good boy. That's a good boy. And see how they're playful. Very normal. Yeah. yeah that's good boy. That's amazing. And I know before we went on camera, you know, it's something as small as what leg you, uh, what foot you step off on that also is a signal, right? Yes. Wait, I'll show you. Come here. Rock foot. Amazing. So if he sees me step off to my right side, he's supposed to sit down mm -hmm. and do that again. He knows he has to stay. Now, if I want him to follow, when he sees me step off with my left leg, stepping up front like that, he knows that he has to follow. Amazing. Good boy. And Phenomenal. Yeah, every week, you have to do this every week. You, you never stop training. Well, it's a repetition yes. thing, too, as well, to keep it. Please. Good boy. Wonderful. You can even hear, you can tell, he's like, oh, where am I at? You know, right, but weird, still, but he listens. Well, and that's curious to me. That was one of my questions. So not only has there got to be a trust and a well-trained dog between, you know, canine dog and partner, but you never can really pinpoint what situation or circumstance you're going to find yourself in. Right. So that obedience has to be so honed in, I would imagine, that they're able, like, to block out being here in the studio right. or... You can tell they notice they're in a different area, but, but we, yet. we've specifically and purposely take them to cruise terminals, loud noises. Yeah. Uh, we have access to Kennedy Space Center, like I said, the cruise terminals right. at Port Canaveral. We can take them anywhere in our county we want and show them different things so that when we go there on a real life scenario, a real deal, they are used to it. They right. don't. They don't. They're, they're normal. They, they block it out and they yeah. do what they're told. Yeah, and I, that's why I'm saying the training in general, you know, is amazing. Talk to me a little bit. Um, you're out in the field, you know. What are some of the ways that, you know, someone like Rocco would assist their partner apprehending criminal aspects or, you know, release on command? That, how do they benefit you? Basically, they're there to go in where a deputy sheriff, a human deputy sheriff, doesn't have to. Okay. So that's their main purpose. The main purpose and what we use them for is their nose. They're a locating tool. So if we're locating, it could be a bad guy, it could be a lost kid. They'll do, they'll track anybody we tell them to. And we only train with human odor. So, uh, you know, we train in our Wednesday night training, we'll go in neighborhoods and dogs will run out and cats will run by and we train them, ignore that, stay on a human odor. Mm. So that's how they assist. Basically, they're a locating tool. Now, when it comes to the point, say, of a suspect, you know, we get close to the suspect, the dogs give us a sign that, okay, they're on strong odor. Mm -hmm. And in working with the dogs and training with them for years, you understand, okay, they're on odor. You can tell we we're on odor. The guy's close. Okay. And then you start giving your announcements, like canine, sheriff's office canine, come yeah. out where the dog's going to find and bite you or whatever it is right. that, you know, the warning is or apprehend you. And, uh, and most of the time they give up. Most of the time you hear them, oh, okay, you know, yeah. coming yeah. out. Sometimes they don't, you know, yeah. and that's when the dogs go in and, and uh, uh, are trained to apprehend, and uh, we're right there with them. Right. And typically, um, just one canine dog with a set of partners or a particular unit, I mean, I would think it would get confusing if there were multiple. Yes, yes. I, I work one dog, one dog only. The same with uh, Son. He works Rocco. Uh, now, uh, we train with them all the time. Right. Say Ro uh, Song, you know, twists his ankle on the... Uh, track, mm -hmm. I can take Rocco and walk him out of the woods and okay. Rocco wouldn't, you know, go after me. Yeah. Yeah, he knows me. Yeah. So that's usually when we do stuff together, we take one canine team, a handler and a dog, and then and the backup is usually another canine handler because they know what's going on and it can help if something does go bad. Absolutely. I know that, you know, we're real keen on, you know, keeping people in your line of work, you know, well protected and, and, and uh, free from, you know, bulletproof vests, different things like that. What is the protocol for a, a canine um, dog? I mean, it, 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 do, it, do they ever wear anything or are they ever equipped in a different way other than themselves? Yes, they do have a vest. Okay. They actually have bulletproof vests that are um, puncture resistant. So okay. they can ah. resist and I mean, they can't, you know, they I do protect, they're pretty thick. Uh, they are thick and heavy, so we don't put them on all that much, but right. we do have cool packs that go underneath them. So if we know, okay, we're going to track 
for a guy that he could be armed. We'll throw the cool pack on him, put the vest on him, and then we'll uh, go for the track. But we monitor it because it, in Florida it gets really hot, even at night it's muggy. If it's in uh, August and you're doing a track in the woods and you can feel the humidity just as much as at night as you can in the day, and then the dogs, you, you just keep monitoring and make sure that, that heat's not getting too high. Uh, the cool packs help out a lot, right. but uh, uh, but we also don't send our dogs on somebody that we know is armed. Right. Uh, we will never send a dog in knowingly there's a barricaded armed suspect with a rifle or a gun. Uh, that's not a job for a canine. Right. And do you see, um, typically, how? I mean, we said you had 13, but in any given unit in, in, in a particular county, is it become more the norm to, to have a set or, of yeah, canine the larger dogs? counties will have more canines. Uh, Orange County, they're, I think they're at 21. Okay. Uh, OPD, Orlando Police Department, they have 20, two different squads. Mm -hmm. uh, the larger the agency, the more canines you'll see. Uh, even small agencies, some of the beach agencies, Satellite Beach PD has one, you know. Uh, it's a dual purpose German Shepherd, does patrol work, but it also is trained in drugs. So. Uh, those guys usually work nights and, uh, and help out the whole beachside community. Absolutely. So one dog can help out Indian River or Indian Harbor and Indian Atlantic and amazing. even us. If yeah. Well, I know that um, we've met Rocco and he's amazing. It's a lot of pressure. That guy, quit my dog. Hey. We'll be right back after this short break. Hey, did you know 2.4 million loving cats and dogs in shelters and rescues need our help to find a home? Let's go to the shelterpetproject.org and meet a few are in a shelter near you. Harlow. Oh, she's one great listener who loves to hear all your stories. My kind of cat. Shrulo. Is a sweet, goofy boy who's eager to please. Sounds just like another dog I know. So go to the shelterpetproject.org, search your local shelters and rescues, and go for a cuddle with your next best friend. Adopt. Welcome to Joy in Our Town. I'm your host, Nick Kroger, and as you can see, I guess with a wide shot here, we have a variety of guests today. And uh, let me introduce the two-legged guests. Um, we have Whitney Hartz on the end over here and uh, Rebecca Carnes. They're with the uh, Search and Rescue of Central Florida. And we are so glad you're here today. And uh, you've brought some friends, so it's only appropriate with that we introduce them as well. But I'll let you guys do that honor. All right, uh, we've got Ellie May. She's four years old. She's a black and tan bloodhound, and um, she is a certified trailing dog. Okay. We have Duke, who's standing up now, who is two year old, and he, he is a certified trailing dog, and he is a uh, bloodhound. And we have Mojito, who is a yellow lab, and she is, she'll be six next month, and she is a certified air scent and evidence recovery canine. We have Kamara on the laying down, and her name, and she is two years old, and she is a human remains detection dog. Okay, and, and what classifies a dog as a search and rescue dog? I mean, aside from tra we know the training, but I mean, well, it's definitely the training. Um, you can see dogs as puppies; um, their instincts, their natural instincts okay. for the different types of. Uh, disciplines that they do um, and then you can take that and have a dog that you know that's wanting to work and then you train towards those abilities and that's uh, really a lot of it uh, I kind of look at it like basketball players okay everybody can learn to play Some basketball potential yeah <clears throat> correct yeah uh, but you have those that are going to excel at it yeah and it's the same with the dogs not every bloodhound is going to be a good trouble right. dog well, and we have a variety of, uh, of breeds here. It uh, uh, leads me to my next question. Are there certain breeds that are just more prone to adapt to what is needed for a search dog, or is it individual like people? Um, it can be individual. Um, we have a variety of breeds on the team. We have German Shepherds. Uh, there's Malinois that do it. There's even standard Poodles, um, Cattle Dogs, Aussies. Uh, there's a, a variety of dogs. That's amazing, yeah. It, it depends on more of their characteristics. Okay. And, and their ability to be able to do the work 
and have the drive or the passion to do the work. Okay. That's more important. Well, that's and uh, be friendly and outgoing. Yeah. Um, but also confident yeah. and with their training and like their job. Yeah. I, I just, yeah. They're, they're just, they're very handsome, all of them. <laughs> um, the training process for a search and rescue dog, um, you know, it, it, do you begin with basic commands and then progress from there based on what you've already identified as their strength or yes, specialty? You, yes, you would definitely want to start with obedience because you want a well-behaved dog. Uh, and when you're out in environments, you know, you got to be able to have your dog break or stop before a roadway to keep them out of trouble, you know, or getting hurt themselves. Right. Uh, then at that point, yes, you'll start focusing in on the skills that you're wanting them to learn, uh, such as with trailing. You'll start out with short trails where someone just runs off and you're holding the dog and it's seeing them. Mm -hmm. And then you progress to further and further to where they're finally out of sight and then and you're just running off of someone's scent article at that point. Well, I think we have an example, a, a video that you brought of uh, Mojito. Yes. Um, and, and how they, he, he or she, she, how she tracks more air scent. That's her specialty. So let's go ahead and, and, and roll that if we can. So explain to us what's happening. So uh, the dog has been given the command to find the missing person in the woods. Um, so Mojito, this is on a GoPro, so this is the actually the dog in real time running through the woods. She's looking for the person. There she found the person. This is during a training seminar. She's doing a refine. She's doing what's called a refine. So what she does is she finds the person, she'll come back to me, and she will, right there, she comes back to me. She tells me she found the person. She grabs a ball out of my hand. She takes us back into the person. So her job is to bring the team in. So if somebody's lost in the woods, she'll actually grab the ball when she finds them, bring, bring the per all of us back in. Oops, she's got to take a break there. Of there course. we go. <laughs> and then she goes and finds the person. Now, if I'm not fast enough, she will come back and she will do a refind again is what she's doing. There she found the person again. Mom's not close. I'm not close enough. Yes. So she's coming back, and here she is. She's made, she says, Mom, come on. They're right here, and she's circling the person until I get there. So she and knows when she's accomplished the yep. task when and you're there. The ta and that's the end. I'm Ma Mojito, that was very good. That's, that's amazing. And, and, and the, they, when they come back to you, it's like letting you know with physical characteristics, but also the act of grabbing that ball says, yes. I found them. Come yes. with me. Yes. Wow. Yep. That's actually really wonderful. And so... Like I said, you've identified, you know, their specialty. Uh -huh. In a puppy, for instance, what characteristic trait would you look for to be a possible mojito where they're dealing with air scent? Um, you would want a dog who likes toys mm -hmm. or, or treats and wants to please. Okay. That's the big thing. Okay. They want to please their handler, their owner. We train all our own dogs. All right. So they are, they are pets as well as, our, you know, working dogs. So they want to please us. And we would um, test, see how, how they react with toys in different environments okay. even as a puppy, expose them to different things to see how they do. You know, they're, if they're shy or anything like that, they may not be the ideal search and yeah. rescue dog. You want something that's outgoing. Well, I know, um, share with us some of the different types of search and rescue dogs and, and uh, how they perform each task. I know we've talked about air scent. What yep, are some of the other characters? like the wilderness um, where they find somebody missing, a hiker let's say, who's wandered into the woods um, and gone missing. We can um, give her, if we have a scent article, we can give her a scent article or she finds whoever's out there. Um, she is also, there's a, what's called an article search or evidence recovery, which is also what Mojito does. She, um, you give her the scent and she will indicate or find something somebody dropped, like, okay. what, like a, a cigarette lighter okay. or their glasses or a cell phone, and she'll tell us that is from that person. Um, we also have the urban tra uh, trailing, um, which is Duke and Ellie, and they also do wilderness trailing. Um, I think we have a video, actually, of yes, Duke we have, we doing do. more of an urban setting mm -hmm. man trailing. Mm -hmm. So let's roll that video and tell us a little Sit. bit about what we're seeing here with the handsome Duke. All right, so Duke, we are in a parking lot, and we are um, starting from the vehicle. Uh, basically, the vehicle is right, right in that area, and he is looking for scent right now. He's he putting his nose down. It's okay. Duke, it's all right. Sit. So he is looking for scent. He is sniffing out the scent. 
and he puts his wow. nose down. So this is where the person walked. Yes. Okay, so this is another training that we've done. He is actually putting his nose down, and as you walk, you are constantly shedding uh, your scent right. onto the ground. So what the bloodhound is looking for is the scent that you have shed it onto the ground. And he's sniffing different, here he's got different types of um, surfaces. They have to be able to do, or, you know, go across this asphalt. Um, also to go across any other type of, we have cement here. Here he's going into a business. It's okay. It's okay, dude. Sit. Sit. It's okay. So he's going into an actual store. He's actually going into walked. a store that somebody walked into. So this would be more for somebody like an Alzheimer's patient or okay. a child All right. who went missing and may have wandered into a store. So he is going off the scent. And the scent uh, can be, uh, see how he's sniffing some of the yes. things around? May have touched. The scent, the child or the person may have touched something. Okay. So they actually verify that. Sit, sit, it's okay. Well, look at you, Duke. <laughs> and and there he is. Found, okay. <laughs> he found the person. Amazing. So that's considered more of an urban or a that's a, an urban, urban type you know, tra sure. trailing. Okay. Look, listen. <laughs> it's like kids. You can't you can't determine how they're going to behave. They're behaving well. <laughs> they do it okay. <laughs> um, Sit. I know that Sit. there's a vast difference between you know an urban setting. To me, a lot of distractions that they have to be able to put out of their mind and stay focused yeah. on that scent. Yes. Um, it's funny that it's Duke and it's a bloodhound because in our minds, uh -huh. isn't that the first thing we think of when we think of bloodhound is their nose and their scent tracking. Right. I mean, it, 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 is that just myth or do they typically are prone for that? I mean, They're bloodhounds. There are other breeds that also track as well, as well, but the, they're known for being very good. When they put their head down, basically their eyes, the, the surface of their eyes here, um, their eyebrows and yes. their ears fall over, the, over them. And what it does is it creates like a vacuum, like a okay. small area. So when they're actually put their head down, they don't even see well. Okay. They actually are vacuuming, they're taking the scent and they're actually vacuum, taking it into their Amazing. nose. Amazing. And that's why they, they do very well at track and track. Ellie May, you feel left out. You feel left out. Well, I know <laughs> Ellie May. Oh, sweet girl. <laughs> I know Ellie May starred in a video you brought, and it's more of a, a wilderness tracking. So let's go ahead and see Ellie May in action. All oh. right. Yes, we were uh, at a park here, and uh, we're actually trailing to find Whitney. And Whitney is, is way far back in the pavilion there. So. She's gonna locate the person and then do what we call our uh, final response. And you'll see, you'll watch when she gets up here, when she locates the correct person, she's going to let me know, hey mom, this is who it is. Okay. And during training, we want to reward heavily when they do that. Yes. And that, that way we know, you know, they're on the right track. Wonderful. Well, I, I just think, it, and what is the training, um, process. I mean, does it depend on what their specialty is, the length of time for them to master this to the point that they would be of great, you know, help in, in a search and rescue? Yes, I think it varies per dog. Um, it also, you know, we have full-time jobs ourselves, yeah. so it also is time dependent yeah. on how much we can get out, but uh, our group requires us to require so much training yeah. uh, per year, and we try to get out at least once or twice a week, okay. uh, six to eight hours a day. And at what age is it good to start training them? I mean, I know you're looking for characteristics even as a puppy. Young. But typically, what age or does it vary? Well, I have uh, had, I've started them as early as 12 weeks, and then I've also started them as, as late as about two to three years. Okay. So, but you want them young, you know, so that, and good health. Um, and that they can they can handle what environments that we actually put in put in front of them. Absolutely, I'm curious if Duke, for instance, you know, mm -hmm. he he's got this characteristic and he's a makes a good search and rescue dog. If he were to have offspring, I mean, do you ever find that there's a line of dogs that are typically have this character? Yes, that, that there is. <laughs> For real, okay. Sometimes there can be, yes. Passing it's, down the family business. Sometimes, yes. <laughs> yes. That's actually amazing. Um, how long have you been in the field of search and rescue? And I would imagine you had to be well trained in yes. order to well train, right? Yes, so I've been in it since 2004. Okay. And in order to be on our team, uh, we do what's called uh, search and rescue, uh, search and rescue 
rescue SARTEC II um, certification, which is done through a National Association for Search and Rescue, and we have to certify ourselves first. Okay. So even before you get a dog or as you get a puppy, you want to actually sort of get certified yourself so that we have the skills in the wilderness to actually do, um, you know, uh, navigation, yeah, navigation, communications, mm -hmm. clue finding. First aid. First aid. Okay. So we have to have all that. Uh, certification first, then we can then we train the dogs, and then we certify with the dogs. And you've been doing this a while. Yes, I've been with Sarcia for about almost two years now. Uh, prior to that, I've have been doing dog training for gosh, I've owned bloodhounds for over ten years. Wow, so. amazing! And search and rescue dogs are used in what type of situations? I know on the videos we saw, you know, possibly an Alzheimer's patient mm -hmm. or someone who went missing or. Um, you know, what are some of the more common things that you find the need for search and rescue dogs? Um, you, you, just like you said, Alzheimer's patients, elderly who wander away maybe in the first stages of dementia or so forth, uh, missing children who wander away, handicapped personnel, mm -hmm. people who are handicapped, um, or it's people who just get lost. They go mm -hmm. out to go for a hike yeah. and get lost, or they're on medications and they don't bring their medications with them and so forth, and, and they get, or they get sick while they're out there. Yeah, but very valuable need for them um, to make search and rescue efforts even more effective, yes? Yes. Yeah. Well, you guys are handsome and beautiful, and I just think it's amazing. It must take a great amount of patience and consistency on your part yes. uh, to make these dogs what they are, and I'm glad you were here. And they love it. They I'm love glad it. Glad you're here. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having us. Yes, we're so glad you're here. And viewers, I hope maybe you've learned a thing or two uh, about search and rescue dogs. Uh, if nothing else, you got to see some amazing, beautiful, and very talented specialized dogs that help our community. And just remember, if we take everything we've learned, we put it all together, we can spread a little bit of joy in our town. We'll see you again real soon. This program has been sponsored by the Trinity Broadcasting Network and is made possible by your telethon dollars. Your continual support can keep joy in our town coming to your home every week. Write to Joy in Our Town, Post Office Box A, Santa Ana, California, 92711.